Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this session, Pioneering Responses to Climate Change Case Studies uh, from Prince Talal International Prize for Human Development. So uh, I would like at the beginning to extend my congratulations to the winners we have of Prince Talal Prize. We have Ms. Bijal Rambat, uh, the second winner of the prize. Uh, representing NGOs in India, and Mr. O OK Zinga, the fourth winner of the prize, representing uh, in the, the individual categories. So Ms. Bijal sh shall receive like uh, 300 US dollar for the project, and Mr. Uh, OK receive 100,000. So congratulations again. In this session, we are going to learn about successful stories of our heroes, uh, winners of the prize, in responding to climate change in terms of mitigation, adaptation, and resilience, uh, and, and going also to hear from the esteemed speakers the lessons learned uh, from their experience. We are also uh, happy to have Dr. Bruce who participated in the evaluation uh, of those projects. That one out of 146 projects uh, were, were, were submitted to the prize from uh, about 48 countries. So, uh, Ms. Bijal is the, uh, uh, Dr. Bruce uh, is the chief innovation Strategist at the Climb A Eat or Climb Eat, right? And uh, Ms. Bijal is the CEO of the Mahila Housing Trust in India. And Mr. OK is the CEO of the Alternative Indigenous Development Foundation in the Philippines. So at the beginning, I'd like to, from the esteemed speakers, to uh, present brief uh, about their organizations. Dr. Bruce, uh, about Clem Eat, please, oh, okay, if you want. Sure. So Cl Clem Eat is an, uh, a small platform, an NGO, and its key role is trying to be a deal maker in terms of making change on the ground. So next month, I go to Malawi where I'm going to be working with the World Bank, farmers, government, to try and change the input subsidy scheme in Malawi. In this COP27, the most important thing for me is deals, and another one is speaking with your previous winner, linking them to some agriculturists and solar energy, and we're thinking about how to tackle the bottlenecks in getting solar energy taken. So that's our organization. Thank you, um, Dr. Bruce. Ms. Bijal, can you talk briefly uh, about MHT, please? Yeah, so the Housing Trust uh, in India, uh, I, I, in the Indian language, Mahila would mean women. So it's a women's housing trust. Uh, and we work with poor women who are in the informal sector to ensure that the housing, living, and working environments are, uh, you know, improving. And the reason being that many women, uh, almost 40 million women in India, actually work from their home. And their houses are their workplaces. And when they are poor, you know, you have teen shacks, you don't have access to water, you don't have toilets. And then you, that impacts your economic productivity. And also we saw two things uh, uh, while we were working with women. One was that in India, women worked almost 16 hours as compared to six hours on an average where men were working. But the asset building in their name was only recent. And, they, and, and the, the second thing was that we saw that when women's economic productivity increased, the entire earnings actually went to benefit their family. So their husbands, their parents, their children more importantly, which was not necessarily true in the case of uh, men in India. And uh, that's the reason we, you know, started working and organizing women's groups to improve their housing, living, and working conditions. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Okay, please. 
Is it a short introduction or because I have a PowerPoint where I maybe repeat, repeat it's things? A, it's only a short production. Short, probably. short. Yeah, very, very sum okay. summarized one. So my name was already said, Auke Itzinga, uh, founder and CEO of uh, the Alternative Indigenous Development Foundation, a social enterprise engaged in the manufacturing of uh, local uh, technologies for basic needs and our flagship technology, which pr uh, gives us 85% of our work is the water pump through which we pump water to higher elevated communities and those communities were waterless in the past and by changing uh, the amount of water, bringing it up automatically, uh, the village starts changing. So it, we manufacture the pump, uh, we, have a, we have a shop, but the whole program is very holistic. It's not manufacturing, it's not just installing preparation. I will be talking about that later. But it more a very holistic uh, approach uh, up till the point because we say it's a low tech, it's an old technology, but uh, uh, we combined it with uh, because everybody has a mobile phone even in the mountains, everybody, you know. And um, so we are using a mobile phone for the monitoring of the systems. So we combine uh, a lot of innovations. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I'll start by, uh, by uh, directing a, a question to Ms. Bijal. Ms. Bijal, giving, uh, give a description about the importance of your project women's action towards climate resilience of urban poor in Southeast Asia? Uh, so uh, we started working across India, uh, you know, trying to, uh, you know, improve ho housing and habitat. So basically trying to get doorstep level access to water. It began with access to water, with sanitation. So household level toilets, not public toilets or community toilets. Uh, then it, pe women started asking finance for housing, uh, housing improvements. Uh, it's, we started with that. And we suddenly realized that, you know, uh, because of uh, the, the climate change, uh, you know, the negative impact climate change uh, increase when you don't have a better house or a working environment. So, for example, if you have teen sheet roofs, your heat increases so much that for some amount of time you are not able to work in the summer season, which is there in India for eight months of the year. Uh, and it's your economic productivity which gets impacted. So we decided we had to work on now uh, how to improve your working environments and your uh, you know um, housing environment uh, so that you could adapt to climate change. So uh, that's how climate change also got included in our work. That we organize and they start working on these issues. Majorly, we identified. So we started working on heat stress. We also started working on air pollution because it's a big issue in our cities. We started working on um, water scarcity that's going to be very big in India as climate change increases. Uh, flooding and inundation because with very little rain we saw that you know some of the slums in which the women were living uh, got inundated and then also vector on disease because as your areas get flooded more and more mosquitoes rampant and you will be subjected to dengue and other things so these women then started taking up these issues uh, and working on Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Izenga, I think you have some PowerPoint slides to, that you would uh, like to present. We can, uh, we can start with that. Um, it was about individual response or individual behavior uh, leading to the uh, that was the original assignment for the session to collective behavior so I, I go a little bit to the 
origin of the of the project. Uh, I, the right picture I never use, but because this is my time as a marine engineer, I studied marine engineering. Uh, I only went to the sh on the ships for two years, but the picture on the right is through the Suez Canal, so it's not a nice picture, but I thought if we are in Egypt, we need to... Uh, um, I come from a social upbringing, from a family which was very active, uh, like in uh, church, in human rights, uh, fair trade, and uh, so that was my, uh, my upbringing. And uh, I, I heard about the, the world uh, problems uh, always at home. We also had to look at eight o'clock at the news all together as kids with the parents. And so this is my upbringing. And um, so I decided when I saw the extreme poverty when I was on the ship for two years because we were sailing all over the world, uh, that uh, yeah, this, this reinforced my idea to change course you now. And so I decided to give up everything and uh, prepared myself on a university and this is a, uh, a cement, a very crude model of the hydraulic ram pump, a water-powered pump. I never heard about it at that time. That was the first time. And it was very uh, primitive, but it was uh, so much convincing for me that, oh, I, we, we, when I go uh, to do my development work in the Philippines, then I'm sure we are going to use this, but I didn't know when or how. And so I will be telling a little bit about the evolution of this. I ended up in the Philippines in a uh, sugar workers program and they, those people were really uh, very, very poor. And uh, there was hunger at the island at that time in 1986, a long time ago, pre-digital, no? And uh, we had to work on uh, food production. So we borrowed pieces of land from the from the landowners, and we produced uh, food with the workers. We had like 200 of such farm lots. And then 1987, the government, uh, the, 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 the dictatorship changed into a democratic government, and then uh, a new land reform program was started. And uh, we were asked by two different banks to help them implement the land reform in areas where we were very active. And so those plantations, when they were given to the workers, all the infrastructure was taken out. Nothing was left. You only had land and you had people and they had nothing and where to start. So we were working in those areas, mostly in mountainous areas, because many of those foreclosed lands were in the mountains. And so we thought, what, what do we need to do? So we started developing all kinds of technologies for basic needs. That was our natural uh, response to the situation. So, but uh, because it was an individual response, I had to put some pictures in. But the most important was really to integrate and to understand really the, the problems of the people. Not, not, of course, we have ideas about how to pump up water or how to solve uh, sanitation issues, but it also has to be uh, completely accepted. At that time, we called it appropriate technologies, no? appropriate for the knowledge of the people, for the materials, and what they are uh, willing to, uh, to understand of it. So also becoming friends with them, no? because they, uh, it's a matter of trust. If you do development projects, it, it is a matter of trust, and then it is very easy also to introduce some new things. No? Uh, this was the, the my father-in-law is a Filipino because I got married to a Filipina. This was the farm of my father-in-law in the mountains. And that became an experimental site for me because I could not experiment in 8 v uh, in the field if you don't have uh, proven, proven things. So we developed many things on his farm uh, at farmer's level. But, uh, not, not big things, but very small things. It's too much to explain, but this uh, area also expanded with other farmers once the water came in. 
with the first uh, ram pump, the hydraulic ram pump I made there, pumping water 55 meters high. Then we could also uh, produce uh, lemongrass. And at the moment, that area, the farmers are organized and they are running a factory themselves for lemongrass oil production. So that's also the story I'm uh, uh, further telling. It's the pump is there to trigger further development. It's not just bringing in drinking water. It's not just bringing house, uh, in household water, but organizing the community and uh, bring, bring further development, uh, trigger it. You have to stop me if I, because if I go all sides, then you know, we have time, eh? Okay. Yeah. This was our beginning. When we left, uh, with four people, we left the union for sugar workers. And uh, so we had many ideas because we saw the, the needs of the people. And we had many ideas on technologies. But we didn't have money, many ideas, but money should also never be a hindrance to start something. You have to start, and then hopefully money comes in. No? Many, many years after also, uh, when you really work hard and uh, consistent, then uh, you also win, for example, uh, a prize like uh, two days ago. No? So that, but that's, that's a long, long process. But remember, this was all pre-digital. You, you know that maybe, for example, if I had to send a birthday message to my parents, it had to be through Telegram. And it had to be as short as possible. Happy BD, because if it was longer, I, I would lose half of my salary, you know. So everything was slow. Research, we didn't have any information available. No books, no, no magazines to study for designs or whatever. So development was really slow at the time. Now I always say to students, they are very, very lucky because everything is already on the YouTube and on, on the internet, but that was not how we started. So this was our, our shop. Uh, it was, this was, it was pre when we started, not, it didn't look like that when we were there, but uh, this is what we rented for the first, that was our start. We had many different technologies for of course, on uh, water, water pumping, different kinds of pumps, also some agricultural production uh, equipments. Later, also the, the essential oil distiller, we designed ourselves and we installed those. And um, biogas, uh, small scale or rather micro hydro. And uh, later, also the, the windmill for electricity generation. Yeah, our, I, I don't read the whole vision, but it is technologies in harmony with nature and uh, people uh, living uh, uh, happy and in, in abundance uh, together. And this is still very applicable even with the climate change now, the, the, the need for environment-friendly friend, technologies, especially for communities that they can sustain and control it themselves is very important, no? So, for the technologies, we use this, uh, this principle. It's a, it's a slogan you can find on the internet, but uh, the designer knows uh, how to achieve perfection, not when there is anything to add, but no longer anything to take away. So, simplification of the technology. It still has to be... Also, poor people want good working technologies. It's not that it's... Uh, too much simplified that it is not nice and also people are not proud to use it. They also deserve, poor people deserve good technologies, but we need to simplify it so that they can sustain it. No? But uh, at the end, uh, the most pressing need, despite all the problems in the mountainous areas, the need for all kinds of social services, was always expressed that it was water. And these are upland areas which are higher elevated than the source. They are waterless, but they are n there is no community without water because everybody drinks water. But how far do you have to go? How difficult it is to get? And uh, over what elevations? So 
for, for me, not because of my father-in-law, but the upland communities are my... Uh, I enjoy being in the mountains. Not so much I feel like being in a chicken house here or in a big mall where you have a sound you cannot identify. I feel like lost, but in the mountains I feel very comfortable. Um, but the mountains are not appreciated like they should. They are politically and economically not, not being considered. But with our agenda or the need for food production, imagine 2050, we need 70% more food. And this cannot no longer come from the local areas which are already highly populated and there is a competition for uh, industrial use, even cemeteries, subdivisions, and it's, that is huge. So this increase from the lowlands is not, the food production will not be increased from the lowlands. There's a huge opportunity for uplands because the systems are not maximized, mostly rain fed. And um, yeah, by that only one crop and it's also risky. So, but once you bring in water, you can completely develop the communities. What we also see is that a lot of young people, uh, this is in any, many countries, that the young people automatically go to the cities. But if we, re if we reverse it and we uh, make agriculture again attractive by using technologies which they can understand and control, and uh, with techniques, farming techniques, they, which are also uh, financially uh, fitted to them, then we can change completely communities, make, make them very lively so that young people have an option to stay. You know? This is a typical uh, uh, situation of uh, people who have to get manually water and then the maximum at a day, if you have to get it, get it from a distance, it's like 20, 40 liters uh, per day at the max. You know? Mostly the women are engaged in that. Then uh, our, our pump, this is a miniature. It can also work in conferences, but I did not bring and we did not arrange for that, but it, it can really work. So this is the, uh, the famous pump, uh, but it's a very old technology. So they were, uh, and they are still being produced like that in England and uh, some industrial countries like France. And those are very expensive. They are not on the market like in huge volume, volume. So how do you import them? How do you get them through the corrupt corruption, uh, through the, the customs, no, corrupt corruption? And then on the other hand, you had the do-it-yourself models which came up when the internet started uh, moving and universities were working on that. Then you had models which are called the do-it-yourself. You can make your ramp pump from, from YouTube. One is very efficient, very expensive. The other one is very cheap, but it doesn't work for communities. It's, it's not working. It's, we combined, we crossbred the, the model, and we came, completely came up with the with efficient as much as the imported one. And the only spare part is an ordinary door hinge, but it's very efficient. No? So people can easily buy a door hinge. So anywhere in a far-flung community where we install the pump, they can maintain it. Then there are also gaskets which they can make from uh, old tires or even from pieces of plywood or from boots or what. So, but the, the pump is very efficient, no? Uh, quickly how it works, it uh, uses the energy contained in falling water. So those cannot be used uh, for groundwater, but you need uh, for uh, deep wells or shallow wells, but we need springs or uh, little streams or rivers to, to get the energy from the free flowing water. No fuel, no electricity, and no greenhouse gas uh, emission, no? The pump operates uh, also 24 seven. This is a typical uh, village, we di divert the water to a diversion tank where we create a certain uh, drop to operate the pump and then uh, bring up the water to the highest point in a village and store it in ferro-cement uh, tanks no, from different sizes. 
And then from there we distribute the water to clusters of households, mostly 10 to 15 houses. Uh, that is if it, this is for drinking or for, uh, for household purpose. But the bigger ramp pumps we make are also used for uh, irrigation, no? for upland areas. These are a few pictures of installations. What is very important is the technology transfer. So uh, after we form a water association, uh, the water association uh, points to certain people who ca we can train as local technicians. So we always say no secrets kept. No? We, we explain everything, how the pumps work, how you have to tune it, how you have to maintain it. So. The first uh, years was very much on the technology itself because we, yeah, it was pre-digital, very hard to get data. And then more and more we had to work on the program around the, the pump, so the social component. Because we come in areas where, where there is, for example, no organization yet, so we form a water association and um, we train uh, local technicians. But the villages are also engaged in the howling and uh, uh, in the actual construction. And uh, we added uh, to that later a uh, new innovation of a water kiosk where people have to throw in a coin and they get 20 liters of water. And the money from the kiosk goes to the water association. So this is to sustain the system themselves and uh, for uh, repair and uh, maintenance, but also for expansion of the project or new projects. No? Oh, yeah. Also, what is there is the, what I mentioned is the uh, the digital, the monitoring by mobile app, because we have installed uh, nearly 600 systems all over the Philippines in very far mountainous areas, and it's too costly, and nobody pays us also for that to to go there on a regular basis to check on the system. So what we do is to monitor, we provide them with a mobile app, the water stations, and they put in some uh, uh, data which we, uh, through which we can uh, see if the system is uh, really working or the organization is active. So once you bring in water automatically, free flowing, 24-7, the whole thing starts changes, changing. For example, for the households, especially the women who, who are uh, using uh, the water for many household cores, uh, it, it starts changing. You know, if you can bring in 10 times more water, though, suddenly all kinds of activities are possible. Uh, it ranges from kids uh, no longer need to skip classes because they were also engaged in fetching water. Uh, skin diseases are uh, disappearing easily because that's lack of water, lack of batting. Uh, also, uh, we filter the water, so every household gets a water filter. And so waterborne diseases are also uh, uh, yeah, decreasing. Then uh, uh, laundry can be done near the houses. Uh, they, can, they, they quickly build their own toilet. Once the water is there, they build toilets. Many of those upland areas they don't have any toilets at, at all, no? Then uh, also some other water-related uh, livelihoods like the lemongrass production, the factory. We can only uh, operate a factory with distillation if you have water for the irrigation of the lemongrass and you have water for the boiling and for the cooling. So these are new things which are uh, possible once the water comes in. Then for... Uh, irrigation of uplands where the farmers uh, are used to uh, wait for the rain and only have mostly one crop. Uh, now, I know that from my father-in-law that second week of May always was, he, he could already plow the land because it was sure second week of May would be the rain. But that's no longer the case. It's, it's so uh, disrupted. And also when you plant, when the first rain comes, you can have sudden droughts. You know? So it becomes very risky. If you don't have water, you don't res uh, re rescue your crop, then uh, you, will have, you will have nothing. When you bring in water with the ramp pumps and you use it to survive your first crop, you can also have a second crop or especially go into some high value crops during the dry season. 
and uh, also diversify the, the farm, no, really, not, not from a mono monoculture. And if you have this kind of development, and uh, we see that some young people are, are making the choice to stay rather than being forced to go to the city. If you are, for example, an operator of a uh, lemongrass factory, the people from the community itself, and he is an uh, operator of the distiller, he is somebody. Also, the self-esteem of the farmers uh, increases by this kind of projects. Also, many people come to take a look at the ram pump because it's, hey, it's amazing if you have a pump down there and it doesn't need fuel, no electricity, and it brings up the water. That's, uh, the, the story goes around. And the farmers are very proud of this kind of technology. So that's, that's very important. We have still time, no? Okay, Pa. Uh, water is very important for, for women, and so they are very active in the installation already. Uh, and around 70% of the officers of our water associations are women. And for sure, they don't just talk about water, because you cannot meet all the time about water. You know? those, those issues are being solved. They start talking about other kinds of wishes they have, and we also introduce the water associations to the local village and to the town. We also sign uh, agreements with the villages and the towns so that they have knowledge and they support the system. So they know about it. And we encourage uh, the members of the association uh, to register themselves also with the town so they get into development councils, for example. So things really start triggering. And our, our assignment there is finished. We install the system. Our technicians stay there for two to three months. Then they go home and we do another system and we stay in touch with the mobile app. Or they come to our office or sometimes we go there. But basically, they have to manage it completely themselves. So uh, then it's very important that they have good connections also locally. So that was the, the statement to the... Uh, the, the pumped water, uh, using it for, to trigger other kinds of developments. Now, this is uh, a ginger production, for example. A lot of vegetable uh, productions also in sugarcane areas where they now diversify with the presence of the, of the water. Now, this is last slide, so we are okay, I think. No. Uh, we offer the technology also to other countries. So there are two ways for us to uh, upscale, upscale this, because we have done uh, uh, like nearly, two, uh, actually precisely 595 villages with 290,000 people. And uh, we can do all those uh, areas ourselves. So we also sell pumps to other installers in the Philippines who can do the same. But they don't have a holistic program with social preparation. It's only a technical intervention. But many are buying pumps from us, and so they are helping other communities. For the Philippines, we can produce all the pumps. We have a shop of 650 square meters with a lot of machines. But so we don't want uh, others to uh, not to compete, but to have inferior quality pumps. We know that we'd make good quality. And so we encourage them to go into installation, not into the fabrication. For other countries, we are offering this as a technology transfer. That's what we did to Afghanistan. Besides doing some installation, I went there myself also to install. But we did a technology transfer, so Afghan people came to our place for two months. We trained them, and they manufactured a pump. Now, this is an, uh, an uh, Afghan-made uh, pump also. Uh, Colombia, Mexico, and uh, Nepal we transferred. So we are open for technology transfer. And, uh, yeah, the license is actually more or less for free because we are a humanitarian organization. So, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, okay, thank you for this uh, holistic approach and the, so with the social dimensions that you are also targeting in this project. So. Uh, now I'll, I'll turn to Dr. Bruce.
Doctor, uh, given that you were among the jury, the, pro the two projects, from your point of view, what aspects that you think were unique in those two projects? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So I, I think if we look at the Philippines example, I mean, I think water is a really crucial adaptation piece of what is needed. And so that it's a really important subject. So that was one of the reasons. Um, I think the next reason was uh, it wasn't only delivering one service. It was health, uh, drinking water, clean water, irrigation. So it was dealing with multiple SDGs as well. And I, I think another third reason was the whole sustainability thing of the not just a techno technology. And the one thing that I learned interesting that he got some inspiration from a, a Zimbabwean, from a Zimbabwean who, who was working on pumps 30 years ago and he read the book from this. <laughs> so it's very nice to see that connection given I'm from Zimbabwe. And then for, the, for your South Asian example, um, I think I think what was really uh, attractive was this focus on the poorest of the poor, woman in slums. That was, you know, not, not many projects can deal with that level of difficulty in changing the conditions. And then there were four uh, pieces I thought were crucial. One was the building of the local woman. One was the organizing and empowering in community-based organizations, and then making the partnerships that would make things happen, like with local government, technical experts, and the women's organizations. And the last one was the technologies or the resilience building techniques that you introduced into the... So it was fantastic. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, Doctor. Would like to from you, Ms. Bijal, about this women-led project uh, to increase the resilience uh, of the urban poor in Southeast Asia, and uh, would like you to explain more about the business model of empowering women in your at your organization. So, uh, what I'd like to tell you is that we were already working across some states in India, seven provinces in India, and these women, uh, slum dwellers were organized around issues of water, issues of toilet, and because they are very poor, and every day, how will I get water, how will I get, uh, you know, my child's fees, climate change was something which was really very abstract for them, oh, it's long away, they, they knew, they understood that very erratic, that it has now increased. But that was something that they did not want to work for. But when uh, we gave them scientific that, look, uh, uh, you know, uh, you won't be able to, your life will even become worse. That is first thing. And second thing, probably what they, what they wanted the most was that their children did not want to, they did not want their children to live the same lives that they were leading. They wanted their children to lead better lives. And then they understood that if climate change strikes, then we are going to, our children probably will be even worse off than what they uh, So they suddenly decided that they also was, wanted to start on working. So the way we started working was that uh, there was a lot of capacity building on these issues required, say for example heat. So uh, we taught, you know, technical things like very, very simple communication to teach them technical things like what is heat wave, how often it is going to come in India now, how many hours of, uh, we gave them the figures after doing the survey from amongst them that how many hours of work they were losing and therefore, you know, how much income. So something very, uh, these families have an average income of 295 US dollars, out of which they were losing dollars when their incomes reduced due to heat during the three or four months uh, data for four months actually only but actually India is for eight months 
So then they started expressing interest that we want our houses to be cooler. And the first thing that example they did was that let's have cool roofs. So we then made them talk to technologists who were providing cool roofs in India. Not technology, several technologies. Uh, then, uh, you know, uh, we said you have to accept it. So we got the technologies to do a pilot in the slums. You must have seen in the video during the award series. Uh, that they got these cool roofs installed. What we did was we actually trained the women to, we put the temperature loggers in their house and we trained the women to take the reading of the temperature loggers after the cool roof was installed. We trained them to look at the readings of the heat from the Indian Meteorological Department and they realized that, you know, it was really working. They didn't want it as it is. So, because in India, you know, the uh, families are used to sleeping on an open terrace during the summer months if, because they can't afford air conditioners. So, they sleep on terrace where it is much cooler. And the way the technologist had given the roof wa was not allowing them to use it like a terrace. So, they said that we will invest only if you make it in a way that, you know, we can climb on it and sleep on it. So, the technologist went back improved the roof and then the women started taking loans. So the next step for us was that we also introduced low, <laughs> low interest loans for these women. They took loans almost up to like a hundred thousand rupee which would come to something like um, yeah almost fifty dollars US dollars and they installed these roofs in their houses. And the fourth thing that did, and we wanted them to also start talking so, uh, to the government. So uh, our cities, as I was saying somewhere, already have heat action plans because there is a lot of talk around heat in India. What those cities did is that the heat action plans only had two things. It had an early warning system. So what the plan would do is they'll say that today is going to be a red alert. So the temperature will heat a certain uh, we go beyond a certain uh, degrees or orange alert or yellow alert and they said the hospital should be ready people will get ill because of heat strokes now our women learned about these cool roofs and they started using it and they went to the government and they told the government that look the city heat action plan can have cool roofs too can have cooling elements too so then the city heat action plans were introduced with cooling elements for buildings and also with greening elements which would make cities much better. So that's how they work, influence policies also. And uh, so it's a holistic approach. One, I would say we build the capacity. Two, they make their own vulnerability assessments and their own action plans. Three, they work with technologists in a radical collaboration. So the technologist goes back and improves the technology to suit the needs of the poor and fourth is that they can take the uh, you know these uh, innovations to the government and if there is a gap there uh, ask the government how to bring in this innovative policies in within the existing policy framework and then of course they also take finances though so that it can upscale so that is in uh, how the model works we start with water but it goes up to climate change the same groups working for that Thank you, thank you, Ms. Bijar. So, uh, Mr. Azinga, uh, given that the, this technology uh, that you are using is energy-free and environmentally friendly, how do you think can this contribute to the achieving the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals? Yeah, it, it contributes to nearly all SDGs because water is important in everything we do in life. So. Um, so the factoring of the pump itself is already a green job. We are changing uh, uh, our electricity supply. That's the idea, but we have already a plan for solar panels on the roof because we only manufacture in daytime. And uh, so the, the sun uh, light is very perfect for directly using the electricity. Um, yeah, it is culture, it's for land, it's for uh, equity and equality, 
So yeah, actually nearly all, I think there are two SDGs, I, I cannot get them from the back of my mind, but nearly all are connected. Of course, SDG 6 is uh, clean water and sanitation for all. But yeah, so it's very much a uh, uh, SDG technology. Actually, we presented it in the UN as a UN sol as an, uh, solution during the 2017 UN site event, and it was also confirmed by the by the organizers that it hits many SDGs. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Dr. Bruce. Akfund is advocating now for and supporting smallholder farmers and especially through and giving your vast experience in many areas focusing on rural development. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, how to improve productivity and living conditions of smallholder farmers, especially ones that Mr. Oke is talking about in the Philippines. Yeah, I, th I think when I think of uh, small olive farmers, my first thought is livelihoods. And it's not so much the technologies, because every, th every different place on the earth needs different technologies. So, for example, your pump's fantastic for the mountain areas. In other areas, it's solar irrigation. In other areas, it's uh, livestock and mixed with crop production. So. So I, my most important thing is to, what do these people need to change their livelihoods in terms of income, health, food security, and work back from that and bring in the technology people who need it. And so it's also a lot about what you people are doing is this capacity building, empowering local people, so that it's not always the technologists telling them what they must do, but them driving the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, Ms. Bijal, uh, you are using the down, top, down to top approach in designing this women-owned solution. Uh, how this approach is helpful in, in uh, achieving the project and, and make it successful? So I think when we use this bottom-up approach, uh, I think it becomes more and more relevant for the last mile. People who are extremely poor, and when they partner with governments, the governments understand and reframe policies so that they uh, reach the last mile. So I think uh, uh, when people, when the, when the last mile people, the most poor and especially women speak uh, what they want and they are able to influence governments uh, for the sheer reason that we have demystified the science of climate change into very simple language, uh, uh, you know, for them. And so they can sit at the table and talk at the same level with the government and that that's really you know bringing around the change in the governments thank you, thank you. Uh, turning to you dr bruce in case as an expert you have been like uh, in the field for maybe 40 years plus in the rural development are there any recommendations you would like to present to our uh, winners of the, to their projects, of their mm. winners? I would say that you've got more to teach me than I can teach you. <laughs> you're at the local level and you understand what's happening and for me that's really important. I mean, I guess the one thing that, that I would say is that science is really important to me as well. And I do see in the agricultural sector lots of political debates that seem to be disconnected from science. And so, you know, the one thing that I'd like to bring to your kinds of communities is very detailed data on, well, this works, this doesn't work, rather than ideologies about what will work and what will not work. Thank you, thank you. Do you have last comments you would like to present before opening the floor to the audience? Or yeah, so I must say that, uh, you know, this effort from Ag Fund uh, has really boosted our morale. 
for two reasons. One is that, uh, you know, we, we really wanted to, I mean, we were already working with uh, partners in Nepal and Bangladesh, but that was more of a knowledge partnership. Uh, it was only sharing knowledge, but not bringing into action, uh, you know, some of the things that we have been doing. Uh, this funding really will be useful because we then now uh, you can actualize in terms of action with Bangladesh and Nepal. And we are also now trying to work as the one of the financial solutions to introduce climate uh, risk insurance, especially on heat and excessive rain for the poor. Uh, and it's different because it's in the urban, it's for women and it's uh, also on heat probably for the first time which is being done and uh, uh, this support will take us uh, quite a long way to be uh, formulating this and it's really a morale booster for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Oak, you have a final comment you would like to present? Yeah, I'm uh, very excited to go home with, uh, with the prize. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, and I hope it's not the end of the story. Uh, we will, we have to do projects for you, so we will be in communication, and uh, we will. Uh, we are a very trusted partner, I can tell you. We are very serious people, passionate. So we hope that we can uh, do some things with you. We had a good talk with uh, a doctor from uh, Badia. And he's a very fast thinker. He nearly wants us, us during the dinner to go to Africa already, more or less. But uh, I hope we can do some uh, serious things together. We are always ready to do the job. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, one of the main objectives of the prize actually is not only announcing winners and rewarding them, but again to uh, give, extend them with additional resources to expand and replicate their uh, projects. You know, out of the, the prize has been established in 1999, and so far we have 79 winners. 22 out of those 79 were uh, uh, finance again. Yeah, in different parts of the world. Some of them in the same country or uh, with the, with the uh, other regions or to transfer the technology and know-how to other, other countries too. Yeah. With that, our session comes into a conclusion. If you have some questions, you have one. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, thank you very much, Bar Barb Ryan with WGIC. That was a great presentation, you guys. My question actually pertains to that last question about potential resources in the future, because my question is, um, how much capacity do you have? Are you at capacity either on either one of the projects? Because I think some of our members would have data that would show you where are the roofs that have not been painted yet, or where are some potential slopes that could be further developed where people live and the slopes are such that they might not have easy access to water. So I think on our project, we might be able to help, but maybe that's of no use if you're already at your full potential and you can't do any more work. So that's my question. Thanks. So uh, uh, I really appreciate the question. Uh, the thing for us is that uh, now that these poor women have started leaning, leading, uh, we have been invited, uh, because we are socio-technical, we also understand technology, we have been invited by very small cities in India. Big cities in India do have the funding, but small cities don't. And uh, we have to make, and which is what I want to talk with you, sir, also. Uh, we have been invited in two cities to make heat action plants 
and uh, green an entire city. Uh, and uh, we are looking now, we will have to look at technologies as to, you know, which spots in the city are hottest. Uh, they have to be served much better. Um, uh, so uh, we have to look at geospatial technologies on land use and greening, what is the existing green cover, for example, and how, after we will do the greening, how much it will increase. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing also is for our insurance work. We are not having easy access to forecasting data. For example, we would need, uh, you know, how many times it's going to heat 45 degrees centigrade over the next five years. Uh, and uh, uh, we don't have access to that data. Uh, we are in discussion with the Indian government, but it's really difficult to sort of, at the moment, that data is not public. They have it all. So we will, one, we will need guidance and capacity to be able to understand how to do it much better and uh, second is also that the technology itself it, if it is viable or not so we need two things and so probably we could look at partnerships with you and uh, with uh, sir here uh, especially on the greening part uh, and with you, we may have other, we are, we are uh, actually not working in mountainous regions as such, uh, but we could definitely look at some of the other partners um, who are working in mountainous region and, and really found it very interesting because it's not using any solar energy and it's not sucking out water from the ground, which is a big issue in India. So I think we could talk uh, uh, you know, we could refer partners to you to take it ahead. Yeah. We we haven't reached. Uh, we did. Uh, we worked since 2012 with Coca-Cola for uh, the sustainability program, not CSR program, sustainability, because they want to offset all the water they use in the bottling, and. Um, that was our peak because before we started from one project to another, then we were doing some once in a while with the sponsor. We had a long-term program with a, with a partner. And um, so, yeah, there was a time that we did a lot of installations and all our key people were not, uh, were getting exhausted. And, you know, you don't also squeeze too much passionate people because uh, that's dangerous you know, for the organization. So we found a balance in uh, doing 20 to 25 villages per year, but that's a big job, that's uh, logistically. Uh, but yeah, we, at, the, at the moment we can use more systems and we can also make use of uh, people who have worked with us before or we have been training. So the number of installations is not a an, uh, not an big issue. And pumps uh, we can easily manufacture in bigger volume. So data would be very helpful, yeah. Thank you. Is there any other question from the floor? Thank you so much. <laughs>